Good, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for coming to this talk. I'm going to describe to you Noxalyzer's room temperature sterilization process that's based on nitrogen dioxide. <clears throat> a little bit about the company first. Noxalyzer started in 2004. It's a privately held company and we're focused on developing nitrogen dioxide based sterilization and decontamination systems for medical devices, also for pharmaceutical manufacturing applications. Our focus here today on medical devices would include any medical devices that uh, would be part of a combination product or medical product that you'd want to sterilize in your own facility using nitrogen dioxide. As a background, nitrogen dioxide is a room temperature process and the sterilant nitrogen dioxide boils at room temperature. Because it boils at such a low temperature, it has a high vapor pressure and it doesn't condense or collect on the surfaces of the medical products being sterilized. And that leads to rapid off-gassing and efficient removal of sterilant residuals from the products that are being sterilized. We use a low concentration of NO2 during the sterilization process, typically less than 1%, or about 10 milligrams per liter to 15 milligrams per liter. In contrast, this is significantly less gas than you would have with an ethylene oxide process, which would be hundreds of milligrams per liter. I mentioned that it's a room temperature process and we don't have temperature control inside the chambers. We allow the chambers to equilibrate to room temperature, but we find consistent process results over a wide temperature range. Humidity, however, is an important factor. You can have a much faster process if you have humidity. Typically, we'll use 70 to 80% relative humidity inside the chamber during the exposure process However, if the materials being processed are sensitive to humidity, if they're electronics components and they might corrode, or if they're biodegradable and you want to have a zero humidity environment during sterilization, that's also possible. But it does take longer. The fastest cycles are at 70% relative humidity and above, and a slower cycle of four or five hours process time for 0% relative humidity is typical. But with the 70 to 80% relative humidity cycle, the exposure time for a load of medical devices is 20 minutes. The door-to-door -door time for the sterilizer might be closer to an hour or an hour and a half because of evacuation, filling, pumping, aeration, and the other processes that go on inside the cycle. I mentioned that the nitrogen dioxide has a very high vapor pressure and does not condense on surfaces. And where that really comes into play is reduces the cytotoxicity that's measured. When we take products that are exposed to our process and we do the biocompatibility testing, we don't see an increase in cytotoxicity after exposure to our process because of the efficient removal of the sterilant residuals. A typical cycle looks like this. So on the x-axis we have time in minutes, and on the y-axis we have the chamber pressure. And you can see by the blue curve, the first thing that happens during the cycle um, exposure process is we evacuate the chamber, and when we reach our minimum pressure, we add a small amount of sterilant. Again, about 1% of the pressure that's inside the chamber is the sterilant gas. And then the rest of the pressure increase is the humidified air that we add to the chamber. You see the plateau at about the 10 minute mark, which is a five minute dwell where the product is going through the sterilization process. In this cycle, you'll see there are repeated two pulses, two exposure pulses in the first half cycle. And we do that because we find it's a little more efficient to have exposure pulses than a higher concentration of NO2 or a longer dwell time. This, in, in essence, stirs the air inside the package and gives a better result. But for the sterility assurance level, we have the second half cycle and then an aeration phase at the end, which could be anywhere from three evacuation cycles, as shown in the graph, or six. It depends on the amount of packaging and the complexity of the product, what sort of aeration is really needed. 
to make sure that the residual NO2 levels in the chamber are at a safe level for the operators to open and start handling the product. The mechanism of action for nitrogen dioxide sterilization has been thoroughly studied, and not only by us, but by a lot of other laboratories as well. We've looked at nitrogen dioxide from the point of view of how does it inactivate microorganisms and spores, and what we found when we looked at several macromolecular processes like DNA degradation and like ATP production, we found that ATP production was inhibited for nine or 12 hours, but then it recovered. The one thing that it is not recovered in the cell process is the DNA is degraded and you have single strand breaks of DNA. When we first noticed this, we thought it was odd, but we started doing a focused literature search and found that this has been noticed by a lot of other research laboratories. NO2 is a common component in smog. A lot of laboratories have studied smog and the impact that smog has, or air pollution has on organisms. And what's observed is that cultured cells exposed to nitrogen dioxide have single strand breaks that aren't repaired. And that's in fact the mechanism of kill that we observed as well. With every sterilization process, you have to show the inactivation curve or the devalue curve. And for the conditions here, which were uh, five milligrams per liter con NO2 concentration in the chamber, you can see that we had a devalue of about 0.6 minutes and that we had a linear six log reduction of the spore population over the full exposure time shown. Some considerations when designing a product for sterilization for nitrogen dioxide are no different than considerations if you were designing a product for ethylene oxide sterilization or uh, hydrogen peroxide sterilization. You have to look at uh, the key variables in the process, and these are NO2 concentration, the pulses, as I showed in the graph, we had four pulses, the relative humidity, we have a range of humidity values that we could uh, use to operate, and also the vacuum. We go down to 20 torr in the vacuum, but that's not a critical value. That is more of an efficiency value. We could use less if we want a faster cycle. But if you have a, a load with a lot of lumens and tubing, then you might need a deeper vacuum so that the gas can penetrate into the lumens more efficiency. And so 20 torr would be a typical value. In contrast to ethylene oxide or gamma radiation, the, the aspects of nitrogen dioxide sterilization that we'd like to point out is that we don't have lengthy preconditioning, we have a very rapid cycle, and we don't have the lengthy aeration time. For a medical device manufacturer, you can do this sterilization in-house by plugging our system into the wall. It's a quarter pallet size system, and you can have less than two hour door-to-door -door time, and you can handle the product safely at the end of the sterilization cycle and you can put the product into the shipping containers and onto your inventory shelves. And with gamma radiation, where you have material changes, cross-linking of the polymers, that's not going to occur with this gas sterilization process either. And so the opportunity would be for uh, temperature-sensitive products, biodegradable polymers, or manufacturers of medical devices that want to do in-house sterilization, you can bring in a sterilization process that's going to have safe level of sterilant residuals at the end and can handle batches at the pace that you're manufacturing them on a product line. Material compatibility is, of course, an important consideration. We've tested a wide variety of materials, and some of the materials listed here are a sample of those, but for example, how many types of silicone are there? How many types of polyurethane are there? They come in numerous blends, and we can't test every additive and every blend of polymer. So we've taken this palette of materials and tested them as an example. It's quite important that you test the exact polymer and blend of polymer used in the medical devices and validate on those products. Across the board, 
most of the materials that we encounter are compatible. Perhaps the most important list are these, the materials that we're not compatible with. Polyurethane and nylon, common materials, especially in catheters where you have a PBAX catheter, we can't process nylon and poly polyurethane materials. Also, Delrin or polyacetyl. Beyond those three materials, almost all polymers are processable with nitrogen dioxide. There are specific chemical reactions that occur in these molecules, in these polymers, and in the other types of polymers, polyethylene, poly, uh, polypropylene, the materials listed on the other pages, they're all compatible with the process. When we say compatibility, it's not just is there a chemical reaction. There's more to it than just the chemical reaction. You have to look at can you get an efficient kill cycle on a polymer. And there's been a, some interesting research done with hydrogen peroxide sterilization where people are aware that you need to test the lethality rates on each individual material. So it's not just material compatibility from chemical reaction, but also from a lethality point of view. Both of those perspectives were screened in these studies. So I wanted to show some examples of specific sterilization uh, cycles that we've developed for biodegradable products or uh, other products of interest. Here we're looking at the polylactic acid type polymers, or the biodegradable polymers, and we're casting a film of the polymer to simulate a device, and we're putting a direct inoculation right on the film of spores, and we're going to demonstrate the lethality on that material. This graph here shows an inactivation of the spores, so it's like a D-value curve that we showed before, but with fewer points, and it shows that we can get effective inactivation of the spores on these polymers from a wide temperature range and with a reasonable cycle at low concentrations. We also wanted to understand, was there a change in the biodegradable polymer? If we had used an E-beam, for example, to sterilize a biodegradable polymer, you're going to get a change in the molecular weight and the uh, biodegradation properties will also change for these polymers. What we find here with the FTIR is that we don't have a significant number of new peaks and we're not missing peaks, so we can say that the material's not changed. We've done studies with biodegradable stents and biodegradable implants, and what we found is that the molecular weight of the biodegradable polymer doesn't change. The mechanical properties do not change, so the, the stiffness, the number of cracks, that's still maintained with a nitrogen dioxide process. And because this is a room temperature process, the glass transition temperature for the polymer is not exceeded during the sterilization process. And the shape or the integrity of the product's form is not changed during the process. Another example is a collagen scaffold. These are used as buttress materials in, in surgery or hernia repair or any sort of tissue augmentation. And we looked at two different types of scaffolds to see how they performed with the nitrogen dioxide process. Similarly, we we're able to demonstrate an, a microbiological inactivation curve. So we've demonstrated we can kill on these materials and we get a six log reduction of the spore population that we inoculated. The method of inoculation here was more rigorous than you'll typically find if you go to your contract sterilization house. We took liquid spore suspension and inoculated directly onto the collagen scaffolds. So for the quilted collagen scaffold, it was an open mesh and the spores wicked in. So it's a true challenge of the sterilization of that mesh rather than putting a biological indicator next to the collagen and having that as a surrogate for sterility. Here too, looking at the FTIR spectrum, we see that we don't change the materials. So the materials weren't changed, they performed as well, and biocompatibility was not changed during the process. So in, in looking at those materials, some of the challenges that were posed to us by customers are the uh, ethylene oxide 
incursion or permeability into the biodegradable polymers causes a change in the cytotoxicity or the E-beam radiation causes a change in the mechanical properties. And in a 60 minute cycle with 10 milligrams per liter concentration, we're able to get complete inactivation of the bio burden and the inoculum without changing the materials. The sterilizer that we've been using for our testing is the RTS 360. It has 360 liters of usable space and is a room temperature sterilizer, RTS. The cycle runs off a microprocessor. It's pre-programmed with cycles that have been validated for the specific products that are being exposed. The cycle times are about 80 minutes. And this would be useful for, again, on-site, bring it in, plug it into your uh, system, or plug it into the wall and just use it on-site. Here's a little video of the product. The way we work with customers is we have our ISO 1345 certificate of registration. We've also gone through further registration with BSI, our auditor, for 14937, and that allows us to do contract sterilization, cycle development, and cycle validation, as well as consulting for sterilization cycle development. You can see that the way we load the system is a cart and trolley system, which is common to most autoclaves. The product's loaded in the chamber. You shut the chamber. Right there in the video are shown scrubbers. We have scrubbers on board so that the nitrogen dioxide that is e exhausted from the chamber first passes through the scrubbers and the NO2 is completely removed from the exhaust gas stream. So again, after the cycle's over, the aeration phase is part of the validated cycle. So when you open the door, we've already validated that that load is not going to continue to aerate or off-gas NO2, so it's going to be safe to handle the products that come out of the sterilizer at the end. Part of the UL safety testing that we've completed and the IEC testing we have for our CE mark is that we have the locking mechanism, the interlocks, the printers, and all the parts of the sterilizer that are required by the ISO regulations. So the benefit of using nitrogen dioxide is to have a low temperature sterilization process that you can bring in house, and it will serve most medical devices that you package yourself or for contract sterilization, you can use the noxalizer system for small batches, rapid turnaround, because the contract sterilizer is not going to be uh, spending days in aeration or preconditioning of the products. The room temperature process, obviously advantageous for some materials. And again, the system is plug into the wall, freestanding, pulls in room air, exhausts to the room, and is a complete sterilization system. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Here's my contact information, or you can visit our website at noxalizer.com. Okay, thank you very much.